I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask and praise be to God. Okay, Krista, you open us in prayer, my dear. Sure, no problem. Heavenly Father, I give you praise, honor, thanks, and glory, O God. Almighty God, I thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to all be here tonight for another time spending in another time in your presence, Lord. Just spending time studying your word and learning more about you, O God. And Lord, I commit tonight's session into your hands. And I pray, God, that everything tonight will be done in decency and in order. I ask, Lord, that your hands will be upon Pastor Thompson. I pray, God, that you will give him clarity of thought and also of speech. And I pray, God, that everything that you use it to teach tonight, Lord, that we will receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the portion of scripture that we are using to pause on the book of Ephesians is Ephesians 1 and 10. So just before we get there, I want to greet those that are on. First, um, Krista, I know Pastor Stephen is taking a, a brief pause. He'll be on later on. Sister Lisa, good to have you on. Sister Susan and the Sister Joyce. I know that this time in Trinidad is a big Christmas celebration and preparation. And so this will be our introduction to a prophetic teaching. We started this also on Saturday, on our Saturday um, Bible study. A great deal of excitement um, is generated there because we have the folks that are very interactive. They get involved um, when we give the home lesson, they go home, they research, and everybody, there's a, a beehive of excitement there because they are doing the digging and they're, and they're getting involved. And as I said last week, the reason why I felt it necessary to introduce this message and this teaching at this time is because of the widespread misinformation of people referring to the mark of the beast in reference to the vaccine. Some people, uh, one of my colleagues, friends that I grew up with in, in my home church and movement, I had to put the phone down on him. But he reached to the point where he said, anybody who's taken the vaccine, um, what, what he said, he was questioning people's, people's salvation. That's how far some people have gone. And some are saying that those who are taking the vaccine are inadvertently injected with, um, what do you call that again, um, Christian? The, uh, what is that thing that they said? That they're putting a chip. And all these types of a wild, crazy stuff that's going on. And so many people don't understand prophecy. They believe that um, this is the mark of the beast. It cannot be the mark of the beast simply because the mark of the beast uh, and the events that people are alluding to will occur mainly during the period of the tribulation period. The tribulation period will occur, it's just seven years, you know. The tribulation period doesn't stretch out, it's just seven years. The, the tribulation period will last for. So we have to take the time to debunk and to discourage the, this misinformation, and we have to explain certain things. I also see it necessary to put in context prophetically what are the events that would occur next in God's prophetic scheme of things. So I am going to put a snapshot on that and take you through those concepts, all right? So uh, chapter two of the book of Daniel and chapter seven, both of them are correlated. We may not have the time to go into chapter seven, but we want to read all of chapter two tonight. And I do not want to leave out any portion. I want to 
take it from the beginning and take you into the reading and get you to feel the effects of this thing, the impact. This is an introduction tonight. And um, thereafter, we're going to take a pause after Christmas, and we are going to reassemble on the, I call next week, Saturday, for us is going to be Christmas. Um, and um, our following event will be the first Wednesday in the new year. So I, when I give you the assignment, I want you to start reading. I want you to start studying. If you are going to be in a position of knowing and not be left there dangling, wondering what's going on and remaining in a state of confusion, we are seeking to correct that and prepare you so you would be inoculated with the truth. So when you hear people say certain stuff, you'll be able to help them and say, no, 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 you're wrong. And that's the reason why we want to inoculate you with this truth. You understand what is to be coming next. The scripture that we reached in Ephesians, and all this, put a mark on this, because when we return, this is where we are going to return in our studies in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10 is where we reach. And hear what it reads. Everybody, the Bible's open. The Bible's open. And follow me as I read. But we, let me put this in the King James. The King James has a poetic element that is very effective, all right? In Ephesians 1 and 10, it reads, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So if you look at verse 10, it's talking of what? That in the dispensation of the what? The fullness of time. Time is coming to an end. You know, we, we use that word, world without end. This world as we know it, this cosmos, as we know it, will come to an end. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. That is not um, coincidental or possible. It is biblically accurate. This world is coming to an end. And if you, you we're going to, I'm going to give you two scriptures so you'll understand where we're heading, right? So in verse 10, it says that in the dispensation of what? The fullness or the summary or the conclusion of time, right? He, God, will gather together in one all things under Christ. So there's coming a moment when this world will experience the kingdom of Christ on this earth. God is going to put all things, not only on this earth, but also in heaven under his son. All things in heaven and on earth will be placed under his son. Time is coming to an end. Let me read the same verse in the, in the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation says, and this is the plan. What is the plan? At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. In the Amplified Version, it says this. The Amplified Version, it reads in verse 10, hear what it says. With regard to the fulfillment of time. So the Amplified said, regarding the fulfillment, the conclusion, the climax of time. Time will be climaxed. Time will be climaxed, right? With regard to the fulfillment of times, that is the end of history, the end of history, the climax of the ages, to bring all things together in Christ, both which are in heaven and things which are on earth. So we know that time is, come, is going to be wrapped up. We know that God is bringing a conclusion to time as we know it 
And at the end of that period, dispensation or epoch, Christ, God will put all things under the feet of his son. Now, while we're on this, let's look at another scripture that will show us time is going to be wrapped up. Look in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse, let me make sure I get it first. Yeah, I'm going to, Ephesians chapter 1, it, and reading verse 11. Not forgive me, Hebrews 1, chapter 1 and verse 11. And then I'm going to read it in one or two other versions. All right? Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 11. Hear what it says. They shall perish. Now, let me read from verse 10 for context. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens, the heavens, the universe, and the heavens are the works of your hands. You know, he's talking about what? He laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens, the universe with all of the galaxies are the works of your hands. Now hear what he say, he's going to say about the universe. In verse 11, follow me. They shall perish. That's the universe that he's talking about. The earth as we know it. They shall perish, but you remainest. And they shall wax old as a garment or a piece of clothing. You know, when you have an old shirt, an old garment, an outfit that you used to wear, you no longer wear it, and you fold it up and put it away. That is the analogy that we're getting here. Hear what it says. And they shall wax old as do the garment, verse 12, and as a vesture or a piece of cloth, shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. So we know the world as we know it, the universe will be folded up. Time is coming to an end. It's coming to an end. And if you read that portion of scripture, I think it's in the book of Psalms, when God is talking to Jesus through a prophetic declaration, he said, sit on my right hand because that is where Jesus is right now, until I make your enemies your footstool. <sighs> He's seated there until the time will be concluded and all power in the heavens and on the earth will be placed under his rule. We know particularly in the millennium, which means a thousand years reign of Christ on the earth, that Christ and the church will be literally running that age. Christ's kingdom will, will be established on the earth, on the earth for a thousand years. Satan will be incarcerated and placed in the abyss. That is a prison in the underworld where he will be in prison, in chains for a thousand years. That's in our Bible. And that's why during the millennium reign is going to be a reign of peace. Demonical powers will be placed on a short leash. Satan will be arrested and placed in the, in, in the abyss, in the prison, in the underhouse, consigned there for a thousand years in chains. He's not the only angel that we see are chained. In the book of Peter, we are told of those angels who kept not their first estate, right? Cohabit came down on the earth, according to Genesis chapter 6, cohabited with women, married these women, and gave birth to children. And the union of angels and men brought about a race of people called the Neptilines. Giants, right? And those angels, according to the book of Peter, are held in a place called Tartarus. In the Greek, is Tartarus. 
both Jude and, the, and Peter said they are held there in chains, in pits of darkness, awaiting the judgment of the final day. That's in our Bible. So just like those angels that are already in Tataras, Lucifer will be arrested by the angel Michael. Only one angel. Lucifer isn't all that bad guy as he makes himself out to be. He'll be arrested by Lucifer, by, by um, um, Michael, placed in chains, and placed not in the in Tataras, but in the abyss. And the abyss is a horrible place. We're going to possibly have a time to look at it, go in there one night and show you what's in the abyss. Some they, 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 they are, my New York American brothers would call it the abyss. But it's a special place where you, like a prison, right? And Lucifer will be held there for a thousand years and will not be able to get out. So what are the major events that are about to happen? We are going to have the rapturing of the church. The church is, that's the next major event. The church will be raptured and we, I'll explain all of that. When the church is raptured, the same time the church is raptured on the earth, the seven years tribulation will, be, will begin on the earth. We'll explain to you why it's going to be seven years. And I'll explain to you why I can tell you accurately it would start at the rapturing of the church, right? For, so the seven years of tribulation on the earth, the most of the book of Revelation that we would read will take up the book, those seven years, all right? So a lot of people need to understand, fit into that seven years, most of the activity that will occur in the seven years of tribulation is what you are going to find in that seven years. The tribulation period, most of the book of Revel events in Revelation will fit into that seven years. We'll explain all of that. The church will be raptured. Tribulation will begin on the earth. It will run for seven years. At the end of the seven years, Christ will return with those of us who are raptured. He will, he will return in the air on white horse with a white horse with multiple crowns on his head. On his leg will be written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Right? He, 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 he would be riding with a, a garment, a vesture dipped in blood, a wine color vesture. Right? And the church will come with him in the air. And the Bible says that every eye will see it. With the technology we have today, everybody gonna see it. All the news medias, people will come out of their homes and look up into the heavens and they will see it. The church returning with Christ in the air, horses, Riding in the air coming to the earth. He will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. And we will rule with Christ. Thus will begin the 1,000 years reign of Christ on the earth. That's after the, the, the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, he will arrive. When he comes back, he will return just at the time when the Antichrist and the false prophet are coming against Israel. Well, the, the, the latter end of the tribulation, it's going to be dark, suffering of all kinds. He will return at that point. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be destroyed, consigned to hell. But Lucifer will be held and arrested, right, for a thousand years, right? So, those things occurring, Christ would set up his kingdom on the earth and we will reign with him for a thousand years. During that period, it will be a period of peace, unprecedented. Longevity would return to the earth again. The Bible said a child shall be a thousand years. Could you imagine that? A child, Krista, 
will be a, a hundred years. A child will be a hundred years. What we know is that oh, most people don't reach a hundred years, but a child will be called, uh, will be a hundred year old individual. And that person living a hundred years will be considered a child. Think of that. Longevity will return. There will be peace in God's holy mountain. Not even among the animal kingdom, there will be any hostility. The lion and the lamb will lie down together, the Bible says, and there will be no violence. That killer instinct of these ferocious animals will be subjugated. At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released from the abyss. He will come forth, go forth into the world because the vast majority of people on the earth, even though everybody are not going to be Christians. The Bible said Christ would rule as with a rod of iron, meaning that he will rule against the wills of man, will of man during that period of time. They will not be able to really protest against him in any serious way. We would rule the earth with him. And he will rule the earth for a thousand years. When that thousand years is up, Satan will be released and he will find a lot of people only waiting for him anxiously. He will initiate the last war, the war of Gog and Magog. The final battle between good and evil, God and the enemy will come to a confrontation. And again, the enemy would lose. Satan, his demons, emissaries, and all those that serve him will be cast this time not into Hades. Hades is where unsaved people go, right? But where the final judgment for all will be placed in Gehenna. That's a Greek word. Gehenna is the final comprehensive judgment. Death and hell, Hades, will be cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire, the Greek word there is Gehenna. Okay, and God will at that point will have to create a new heaven and a new earth. We'll come to all of those things. I'm just giving you a kind of panoramic view of what are the major events that's coming, right? So at the end of the millennium, Satan release, the final battle, Gog and Magog, will take place. Satan will be will be held, all his emissaries, the enemies, right? As a matter of fact, let me inject this. Um, Satan will be cast into the lake, but at the end of that period will come something known as the great white throne judgment. All the souls that are in Hades right now will, be, will come out, will return. There will be a resurrection of the unrighteous dead. Like I had a resurrection for the church. I'm giving you all a snapshot, giving you all the little pieces, putting them together and giving you a snapshot where we are heading. And we're going to go there in all those compartments. All right? So, so, so one of the things that you have to grasp is at the end of the thousand years reign, Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. He's already judged. But the rest of mankind, there will come a judgment. Like the resurrection of the, the rapturing of the church, where the church was resurrected, those who were dead in Christ would rise first, and they were raptured just before the, uh, just before the tribulation period and taken to heaven. At the end of the thousand years reign, when Satan is in, will be cast into the lake of fire, there will, God is going to cause a resurrection of all ungodly. They will resurrect it, the Bible says, the sea will give up the dead which would be in them. Death and hell will deliver the dead up which is in them. Right? And John said, and I saw the great white throne judgment. And every man will stand before God and the dead will be judged out of those things that are written in the book of life. 
so that the judgment will be set. People's lives will be replayed in a massive screen. All the lies that people telling now and getting away with it, people will end up in, in jail for the killing of people. The truth is going to come out. Everyone, every human being will have their life story viewed by everyone. Every sordid bit of information on humans will be exposed. And the Bible says at the end of it, those whose names were not written in the book of life in heaven, those who did not make it, those who rejected Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed on him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. But verse 17 went on to say, and they that believe it not shall be damned. There's a damnation. There's a judgment coming. The Bible says, if God spared not the angels that sin, huh? he didn't spare, spare the angel. And the, 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 the law that was given under the administration of the angel, of angels and every sin that men committed, they were judged harshly. Paul says, if that happened under angels, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The great plan of salvation to redeem you, you reject it, and you're going to pay an awful price. The lost of your soul. And so we're going to have the final, um, the, the judgment of the lost, and, and everyone whose name did not make it, in, was not found in the Latin's book of life, the Bible said would be cast into the lake of fire. That's in your Bible. We're going to come to it. We have to teach everything now. People have to understand what's going on. What's coming next. I'm explaining to you what will come. Make no mistake about it. This is around the corner. The events that I am describing to you is what will happen. And when those people at the great white throne judgment are judged and cast into the lake of fire. At the end of all of that, God will have to create a new heaven and a new earth. In that new heaven and in that new earth, God will have done something. The great city called the, the New Jerusalem, which is God's home, what we call heaven will appear into our dimension, a four square city. The foundations are 12 foundations made only of different precious stones, not concrete. Different varying colors, colors on that we have never seen in our lifetime. The, the throne of God, the new Jerusalem will be the home of believers, us, the saved, the redeemed. People who made it through the tribulation. Well, at the end of the millennium, man is going to be judged. Those who didn't make it will be cast into the lake of fire. And God will then create a new heaven with only righteousness. A new heaven, a new earth. The galaxies we see there will no longer be there. God is so powerful, he could do anything he wants. A new universe, a new heaven, a new earth. And as we look up, and as we can see the moon and the, and the sun and Saturn and Mars, you will be able to see the throne of God, the, 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 um, the new Jerusalem, a city built four square. It's not going to be, it's going to be a cube shaped city, 1500 miles on every side, east, west, north, 
One side is 1,500 miles. How much is 1,500 miles? Uh, 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 you know the distance from here to Trinidad by plane will take me almost five hours and Trinidad is 2,000 miles from the US by plane. If you travel at 500 miles an hour, it will take you four and a half, five hours to reach here. That's a 2,000 miles journey, right? So could you imagine driving, if you were to take a plane <laughs> to fly from one side of the city <laughs> at 500 miles an hour, it's going to take you about five hours. And when you reach one side, you take another, the other side, go to a cube shape, a complete square. And as, as it's as wide as it is wide, 500 east, west, north, and south, and 1,500 miles higher. <laughs> the foundations, 12 foundations made of pure different colors of stones, not concrete. In that city, in the middle of the city, it will have something called the river of life, a pure river. That will be a living water, living. I believe it's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That's my view. People who swim, people who visited heaven, went and swim in the waters there. <laughs> you, you go under that water, you could breathe on there. Breathe on there, like a fish, and you wouldn't drown. People been there, came back and they shared their experience. They say when you swim in that water, it remove all the scars of what, of, of, of what you endured here on earth. All the bad memories, it bring healing to you. And on either side of, of that river, you have trees. It, it, I used to think it was one, the tree of life was one tree, but no, right along the banks of that whole river are the trees of life. Each month, it produced 12 different precious fruit. One, uh, Jesse Duplantis had a book he wrote. He had a trip to heaven for six hours. It's amazing. I try and get Christopher, we could put, get our resource room and we put those videos there so people in our Bible study can go there and listen to the stories. You're going to have a lot of great uh, resources that you could use. Go into your resource room and listen to the stories. He said when he when he was he was taken into the heavens, and the angel said, "You came here. You have a, you have a, a, an audience with God." And he said, as he get, got closer to the to the to the throne room, God, listen, the, God is a beam of light. You, you think the sun is 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 bright? No. He said the the body could not take the blast of that energy, and he had to be constantly given a special fruit. And as he ate the food, he felt strong. Felt strong as he ate that food. Right? So I don't want to get lost in that. I'm just giving you the synopsis of where we're going. So there's going to be a new heaven. And in the new heaven, there'll be no need for the sun. No need for the moon. Because the Bible said, the glory of the light of God's of God and Jesus will light up the whole universe. You don't need T and Tech here in New York. In New York, they call it Con Edison. Across the river here in Jersey, we have a different um, electric company. Uh, you don't need any of those. They will be out of business because the light that emanates from, from the throne room will light up this place. Light it up. These are great days. In spite of all that you see happening, these are amazing days for the church. Amazing days for the church. And I want to encourage all of us tonight. All right? So we, we, we'll spend our time when we get there. New heaven, new earth. 
you know, Chris, how do you think people will travel during a, uh, uh, what do you think will be the source of travel in, in that in that period? G g g give in me the your period thoughts. of the new heaven and new earth? Yeah, how do you think we will travel? Um, I think that we will all have a, a speed within us that we don't need any mode of physical transport. I think Very that right. by our thoughts, we could be able to get That's what it is. That's what yeah. it is. We will be able to travel at the speed of thought. And one person said you can travel any mode you wish. If you travel at the speed of thought, you wouldn't see where you're going. You just end up there. Said, but if you want to take your time, you say you could glide. <laughs> you say you could glide. He said, people don't walk, you know, they glide. If you hear the stories, this guy had over 80 trips to heaven. 80. He said he stopped. He said he stopped checking at the at the ATA trip. And if you hear the stories of people that God is allowing to see things, to become witnesses to us, this is not make-believe. God allowed John in the book of Revelation to see the, from his time towards the ending of time into, into the, the ending of the tribulation and the, and the millennium and to see even a new heaven, a new earth, a, a new world tomorrow that's coming. That's why the Bible says, he that have this hope in him should do what? Purify himself even as God is pure. Purify yourself. It's worth living for God. No sin is sweet enough to compromise with your soul for what God has prepared for us. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, no ears heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of a man. The things which God had prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed them unto us how? By his spirit. If the Holy Ghost is more than willing, Krista, to take us as we live for him and walk with him, I believe some of us could get trips there. I believe that. I believe as we begin to live in the spirit and begin to pursue God, many of us will be taken in by the spirit into excursions in heaven. That's my belief. This world is not our home. This world that we are, this cursed fallen earth that we are presently alive in is not our home. It's not our home. So when I see people fighting to let the to, to get the political system to do what they want, they're only fooling themselves. He that is pure, let him be pure. He that is vile, let him be vile still. God said the day is come, every man is going to give an account. You cannot prop up the evil. You, I mean, despite your best intention. We will not call for this. We will call to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is what we are called for. Now, I want to take us now to the book of Daniel chapter two. And we are going to spend, it's now 10 minutes past eight in your time, 10 minutes past seven here. And this is where I'm going to introduce we are going to look at the prophecies of Daniel. And we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. I want everybody on tonight. Now, I said it, and I want to keep telling you. What I want you to do, I want you to take this subject matter seriously. You're going to move very quickly because there's a lot of material. I believe we can get through reading the entire chapter two tonight. This is not Ephesians. Ephesians is doctrine. We are going there in a particular way. Here is different. I'm preparing us for where we are heading. You must have an awareness, a consciousness, an expanded consciousness of what God, what is about to come, what is around the corner. You must not be in ignorance. Too many are in ignorance and are coming to crazy conclusions. And it's not Bible.
So we're going to look at Daniel vision, both chapter two and, and chapter seven are correlated. They are inextricably linked together. And we're going to bring that up because what it will tell us in terms of the politics, in terms of the political systems, what will happen is going to give us an idea of what, through what system the Antichrist would come. The kingdoms of this world, as we would learn in the prophecies, will all come to an end. Political systems will not last. We're going to see the five different kingdoms. We will see the, the kingdom of gold, the kingdom of silver, the kingdom of bronze, the kingdom of iron, and the final kingdom, the kingdom, the stone kingdom. And in the stone kingdom, in the age and the period of the stone kingdom, the tento kingdom, the tento kingdom, is a tento kingdom from which a union of, of nations from whence the Antichrist would come. That's why Krista and I were doing a little, putting our heads together to put some... Um, Stats on some, you'll have some images that you could look at. And um, so we want to begin right now. It's now 8.13 in Trinidad's time. And I want to be aware of that. All right. Uh, turn to Daniel chapter 2, and we are going to read. We are not going to jump and push things through. And I want to lay a proper foundation. I want to give you a feel of what Daniel went through, what this great King Nebuchadnezzar had experienced, because God has a way of getting involved in human affairs. Let me tell you something. The Bible said God deal in the affairs of mankind. You are not a, a power to yourself. America and all these different Political systems are not power by themselves. God dealing in the affairs of men. He set up whom he wants and he can take down who he, when he wishes to take you down. It's not just the will of the people. God can put it in the heart of a man to rise up against a, a person and take them down. We're going to study those kingdoms from the beginning of time. There were four World powers. We have not had a world power in our time. What we have, superpower. America is a superpower, but she's not a world power. This crazy man from Germany, Adolf Hitler, he was trying to do what the other emperors in the earlier periods did. The kingdom of the, the, the um, Babylonian kingdom, that was a world power. That was a a world power. The kingdom of the Medes and the Persian, that was considered a world power. The kingdom of Alexander the Great, that great Macedonian king, that was a world power. The kingdom of Rome, Rome ruled the world. We have not seen that. You have not seen that. Now we have all the na United Nations and United these different political systems have come together to protect each other so that no one person will try and come and subjugate others against their wills. Kingdoms have decided that we will not allow anyone to, to interfere with the, with the, uh, uh, the sovereignty of a, of a country. It's a, it's a, so we, those systems are in place. There are hardly any auto, autocratic system. We have democratic systems of government. We are the communism party that failed. Communism has failed. It has not worked. But sadly to say, we are seeing here in America the possibility that this democracy, if it doesn't hold together, the democracy, America is the mother of democracy. And if she fails, because what you're seeing right now, the political infighting, God doesn't touch this country. We can see the debt of democracy 
in America. That's what we can see. Let's turn to the reading of Daniel chapter two. And uh, we are gonna only do chapter two tonight. And when we next meet, we are going to do chapter seven. But you are going to continue your reading and your studies. I want everybody on tonight, just don't be an attendee. I want you to become a participant. I want you to get involved. I want you to get involved in following my instructions. If you do, you will be an informed believer, not misinformed. And you'll be able to help other people. All right? So let's begin the reading in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Reading from verse one, and it reads, and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, let me read that again. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep Break from him. Now, I want you to, when you read, I want you to understand, get into what's going on here. So we like to run through things. This man had a dream that was so horrific to him. He said, notice how it's described here. He had a dream. Notice, he dream dreams, plural. Right? Where his spirit was troubled. He knew that dream had some kind of significance. Have you ever had a dream and you know what you dreamt there? It, it, it troubled you? So I don't understand what kind of dream is that? He was going, he was, what the dreams that he held, had arrested his interest. Notice what it says here. His spirit was now what? Troubled. Troubled. You know, God has a way of getting the attention of people. God was involved in the dreams that he was having. These were not normal dreams. And somewhere in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, he knew. He couldn't understand it. It troubled him. It arrested his attention. And, and you know, many times we see God doing this. We saw God did it back in the book of um, Genesis with the Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh? Who had a dream with um, the seven year, uh, 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 um, these the, the 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 plenty years of plenty and the years of farming? He didn't know what it meant because God was involved in that as well, and it was God's way of saying, "This is not in your purview. You have to tap into me to find out what it means." This is man, not man's ability. That's why none of both in the case of Pharaoh in Genesis, his people didn't understand that. And in the case of here in Daniel, his wise men, I mean, you had to give them credit because these guys couldn't even, the, the dream was gone from, from the king. Let's run through it. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. He jumped out of his sleep. And he couldn't sleep. Think of that. That's the impact it had on him. God was arresting the mind of a leader. No man is too big for the God of the heavens to bring under his control. When you pray and ask God to intervene, you must understand the power of the God you and I are serving. You're praying about something? Believe it. Expect it to happen. Look in verse 2. Read with me, everybody. But read with me. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Now, this man, the dream, had left him. He had forgotten what he dreamt. But this thing had him in a state of panic couldn't sleep. Look in verse 3. Read, 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 read with me. And the king said unto them, 
I want you to hear the conversation. I have dreamed, he said, a dream. And my spirit was troubled to know the dream. He was troubled. Verse 4, read. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in the Syriac language. O king, live forever. Tell thy servant the dream. And we will show the interpretation. What is the response in verse 5? The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. It's gone. It has abandoned me. I've forgotten it. The thing is gone from me. Now hear what he says. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a downhill. This guy was fierce. He wasn't asking them to interpret it only. He said, I forgot my dream. You must remember the dream I had and then give me an interpretation. <laughs> Krista, what do you think of that? Um, from reading, I can think that he was a bit bold in that request. Yeah. As you say, he was a bit bold faced, but he wanted what he wanted. That's how kings and autocrats operated in those systems of government. There was no democracy there. When a king tell you, do this, you don't do it, you're dead. There was no court to hold him and arrest him for murder. He was a sovereign ruler. That's how autocratic systems of government work. You see. He says, if you don't expect, give me, find the dream out, how you can, it must be right, and you must give me the interpretation. And if you don't give it to me, I'll cut you to pieces. And not only will I cut you to pieces, I'm going into your house, and I'm going to make a rubble out of everything that you all can, all your possession, and mash it up. Now, that is a crazy fellow. But that's how desperate he became. Because that dream, he knew that dream, that dream had, had some form of major significance. Look in verse 6. Mr. Thompson. Go ahead, Pastor Stevens. I remember when we did this some years ago, one of the things you explained is that those magicians and Chaldeans, the thing, in other words, what they put on their resume, that is what he expected from them. They were the ones that would say they would know all dreams. Even if you can't remember it, yeah. So right. they were like that. So what it is, at least you would have explained, is that it might have been bold, but it was not um, uh, 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 unfair at that particular time because yes. these guys put down that they could, they are no all mysteries, all secrets. Yes. So he, this one kind of put them in a corner. So that it's is why right, the couldn't come up with it. Yeah. But again, this one, you see, you see here the difference passes here. If the source of this dream came from demons and devils, they would be able to access that source. But that did not come from demons. Because they are tapping into the world of spirits. They are delving into the world of principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and dark forces and spiritual wickednesses. So once they're tapping, that's the source they deal with. That is why when Moses dropped down his um, staff and it became a serpent. Janis and Jambis was able to do the same thing. They were magicians. They were involved in the world of witchcraft. They were dealing with dark forces. The same way we deal with the Holy Ghost, they are men who deal with principalities and high powers. So if the dream came from those powers, they would have been able to explain it. That's why the king couldn't understand because those guys on other occasions would have been able to explain dreams like that. As a matter of fact, they will tell the, dream, the king, king, you had a dream last night. In the dream, they could tell you what you dream. <laughs> they 
can tell you, a sorcerer can tell you, call you out and say, you had a dream last night, and in the dream you saw X, Y, Z, 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 Z. They can tell you because they are involved with the powers of the, of the dark forces. And those spirits will give them the information. You know, Sister St. Louis, she don't mind my telling you this. She was a medium before she got saved. Her husband was a top witchcraft worker in San Fernando. All kinds of politicians everywhere went to him, right? And she explained how he got his information. She said he will open up himself and those, she said you can tell when those spirits came into him. She, they will adjust where they came from, what realm they came from. <laughs> they will address her. And people come now to a seer man. They're not talking to the human. They're talking to spirits that have control that man. So when you're dealing on that level, you can get information, providing that the source of the information is coming from that source. But the source did not come from that source. That information came from God. And those devils and demons that those men were accustomed playing with, they could not, they didn't have an inclination what it was. You know, this who, who got the information, who got the interpretation. And this is significant. So the king was in a sense justified in the context in understanding that these men dealt with dark forces. Janis and Jambres throw down their staff as well, and their staff turned into a snake. We saw it in Exodus. But the superiority of God on display was that Moses' staff ate up their staff. Because when God is involved, the devil has no antidote for God. Do you all understand that? You must understand regardless of whatever you see manifesting in this period of, in history, do not become afraid. If the God that we serve and we live for and we give ourselves to him, the Bible says, draw nigh to God and what? He will draw nigh to us. You get close to God. You don't have to be afraid of what variants coming next. Follow the laws of the land. We must obey the laws of the land. Don't act foolish like other people. Don't be afraid to take the vaccines. Don't be afraid of that. God has not given a lot of people his fear that's controlling them. And God has not given to his children a spirit of fear. That's the problem. A lot of what, oh, people, oh, it doesn't, listen to me, it's fear. That's why they're afraid to take it. Let's run on. In verse six now, follow me. But after they show, but, at, but if they show the dream, and the interpretation, therefore you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. So he's telling them there's an other end of the call. If you only tell me what this, this dream is, I'll, I'm going to give you rewards. I'll give you gifts. I'll bestow upon you honor. Huh? Therefore, show me, he says, the dream. And the interpretation. I want you must show me the dream, not a dream, you know. I want the real dream that I saw. You must recall that. <laughs> and then give me the interpretation. But this dream did not come from devil. This dream was not a concoction of his own mind. You hear what I'm trying to tell you? When God is on display, demons cannot decode God. When God is moving in your life, no devil, no wizard, no witch, I don't care what, where they went, how far they went to throw spell on you, it is going to backfire. I can tell you, I know what that is like. You live for God, God is going to protect you. That's wrong. Verse 7, read with me, everybody. Verse 7, they answered and said, again and said, let the king, now these guys was not giving up, you know. They knew they didn't, they, this has been on them. They, 
Then they answered and said, let the king tell his servants the dream. And we will show the interpretation. Look at verse 8. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you will gain the time. In other words, you're playing for time. Because you see the thing is gone from me, he says. He said, you're trying, to, you're trying to play for time because you see it left me. In verse 9, he says, but if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. This is a threat. He's desperate. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak. I know you will come up with some kind of ratch, some kind of scrap up this, um, a, a dream. I know fool. I may not remember it, but I know what I saw. He said, don't bring nothing lying to me, anything deceitful. I'm going to smell it. He wanted to know the dream. Right? So he says, speak. So he said, I know that that is what you're planning. Till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream. And he wanted them to stay right there and give it to him. Tell me now. <laughs> and I shall know that he showed me the interpretation thereof. He was not relenting, he was not giving up. I want to know it now. Verse 10, read it, Pastor. The Cardians answered before the king and said, There is not a man. Now they're telling him the truth. There is not a man upon the earth. And they're telling him to his face. Nobody. I don't care who you are, Mr. King. They got angry at this point, Pastor Stevens. They had enough of the threats. They're human beings. There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king this matter. Nobody can show you what you're asking for us. Therefore, there is no king, lord, no ruler, that asketh such a thing at any magician or astrologer or Chaldea. They, they got real mad now. It seems as though they reached the point where they had had enough of the threats. Look at verse 11. And it is a rare, they continue talking, and it is a rare thing that the king requires. And there is none other, and there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods <laughs> whose dwelling is not with flesh. Wow. So nobody can tell you that. And this is a revelation it's for us to learn. That when God gets involved in the affairs of human life, the devil has no antidote for you. When God is on your side, let me tell you something. You become a mystery to the, to the evil people. I remember Jenge. You all, God, listen to me. God used Jenge, used me to teach Jenge because the Lord told me that. When Jenge got close by and, be, and I began to feel the evil coming from him. I went before the Lord and said, Lord, Lord, what's going on? What's going on here? The Lord, the Lord said, I put him there to teach him a lesson. That's what he told me. After many years, listen to me, that guy was a child of the devil. I hope for his own sake that he made it right. And the year that he came down with the stroke, I went before, I said, Lord, how long has he not learned anything? And God told me, son, let me tell you something. I am going to neutralize him. That's what the Lord told me. I am going to neutralize him. That's what God said. Before the year was out, he was smitten with a massive stroke. And then I heard some of his people went all over the place saying that Pastor Thompson went to America and worked witchcraft on Jinke. I went to America to work witchcraft on Jinke. The God of heaven. And I want some of you to know, when God begins to lift you up, attacks will come. But you ought not to be afraid. There are things going, when God lift, told the devil, was boasting about Job. Job didn't know that was going on. He didn't know there was a wager going on. There are a lot of things we don't know. <laughs> We don't have knowledge of. 
Here is it that this king, God was dealing with him and the powers of darkness did not know what to make of it. Did not know what to, and I'm saying to many of you, when God hand is upon you, it doesn't matter who go where, do what, what incantation, whether when they went to a cemetery 12 in the night, what they turn east, west, no, I don't care what they attempt to do. I am here to tell you that the God that you and I are dealing with is well able to protect you and you have no reason to be afraid. Sister Joyce, I saw your hands up. Pastor, what, I was, saying, what I was saying here is even although they, be, they um, deals with other um, forces, you know, like working for Satan, doing witchcraft and stuff. Yes. You know, they, they knew who God was because they tell him, even though, you know, nobody can't interpret it or tell him only the God, only the true and living God. So even though they were, they knew who God was. But it, it, remember, Lucifer came, was a guardian angel. <laughs> Lu, Lucy, Lucifer was an anointed cherub. <laughs> He was anointed cherub that God, the presence of God in him. So all the evil powers that came from, all the demons, where you think they were angels. They lived in the presence of God. They, so they, they, they will corrupt that information because they're not going to get any benefit from it. But they, they, these guys said, that information you're asking for, we don't have it. They, at least they understood that. That information you've asked for, and says, Joyce, you're right. He said, that information comes only from the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. <laughs> and they were right. Read with me verse 12, everybody. But we'll be running. We want to finish this tonight. But, um, let's move. For this cause, the king was what? Angry. And very furious. That, that is an anger and a rage. He flew into rage. An uncontrollable flight of anger and rage and indignation. He lost it when he heard what the, the I mean, that they, they were very cutting in the remark. They said, you, what you're asking, nobody could answer that. I don't care what you say. We don't have the power to give you that information. What you're asking is unreasonable. That is what they were telling. But brother, he flew into a rage, a fit of anger and commanded to destroy all the wise men, not some, and all of the wise men of Babylon. And because Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach and Abednego were in that classification, they were also rounded up, even the innocent. Read with me verse 13. And the decree went forth that the wise men should what? Read, be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. They too were rounded up. Then Daniel answered with the council and wisdom of area, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. So Ariok um, was the one responsible for rounding up and killing these wise men, Ariok. Verse 15, he answered and said to Ariok, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? He considered it hasty. Then Ariok made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in. Went in. Everybody say went in. That is boldness. He went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. He's the only one who came to the point and said, king, I can show you the interpretation. Because they said that could never happen. Daniel was able to say. And what is the lesson there for us? That when we hang out with God and got, get intimate with God, the secrets are for those that are close to God. You see, if you're on the surface, that's why a lot of people are losing, afraid to take vaccine. They're afraid they're listening to all kind of, all kind of misinformation. They're traumatized. Because they don't know God. They're traumatized. They're afraid. They're intimidated. Those of us who oh, we are men of God, I'm a bishop, I'm a pastor, we are afraid. You're trying to tell me 
that Mark 16, 17 to 18 would not work. These signs will follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils, lay hands on the sick, and if they speak with new tongues, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. You don't believe that God, especially in this pandemic where we need to arrest this virus and bring it under control for the world to return to semblances of normalcy, There's no harm, but they but people are traumatized. Right? Let's run on. So when Daniel told the king in verse 16, I can give you the interpretation. It calmed him down because up to this point, they were saying it's not possible. They were saying the only person that has that information is the God whose dwelling is not with flesh. So if God is dealing with humans, then how could you get it? <laughs> Think of what they're saying. God don't, the dwelling is with God whose dwelling is not with flesh. So how could you get information? If the God you're dealing with, he don't deal with humans. But God was going to use this whole event to teach Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar became converted. You know? He was high. He was thick skin, but God was dealing with this guy. And he was using Daniel. Daniel's relationship with God was impacting that political leader. That's the reason why this crazy stuff in America, where too many of God's servants are compromising with political systems just so that they can have connections. Daniel was not doing that. It's the other way around. That when a man weighs Please said God, God will make even his very enemies to be at peace with him. Daniel was not compromising. Notice we are running. In verse 17, read with me. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Those are the Babylonian names given to these Hebrew immigrants. Verse 18. That they would desire mercies of God, the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Their lives were dependent on getting it right. I believe what's going on in America with the false prophets, prophecies coming from a lot of men of God. Look at Pastor Gill in Trinidad. Disrespecting our, our prime minister. I listened to this. I couldn't, I can't, up to now, I can't catch myself. You don't treat a leader like that. Worst of all, your leader. You don't have to agree with him. Look, look, at the, look at how Daniel is behaving. Daniel had every right to have an attitude. Why are you rounding, rounding me up to? I, I wasn't part of the party. Why are you coming to me now with that attitude? That was not his attitude. Verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night's vision. The secret was revealed Unto Daniel in a night vision. I believe that as we get close to God, God is going to, listen to me, the world will fall on its knees before men and women of God who begin to live in the realm of the spirit. There are too many things. The flesh is acting up as if it's the Holy Ghost and it's not God. A lot of men who are prophesying, thus said the Lord, and God is not saying a word. And rather than they fall on their knees and repent and ask God's forgiveness, they continue giving more wrong prophecy. I would have fallen in my face. I wouldn't come out of my house until God showed up. But lots of those guys, they want to gain political recognition. God is not into our politics. He's not. Look at verse 19. Follow me. <laughs> then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision, read it, pastor. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Verse 20. 
Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removed kings. He set it up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that them that understand it. Who does all of it? God is the one who does it. He sets up, he takes down. He giveth secrets. He gives revelation. I believe in this hour, if the church were to fall on his face before God and truly admit God, we have failed you. We have failed our generation. We, 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 in the face of this great, this virus, the church, men who are proclaiming to be men of faith and men of power came together to curse this COVID-19 big demonstration and nothing has happened. Has anyone fallen on their face and cry out in repentance? We ought to have mass repentance meetings going on. Something is wrong, the fact that this COVID-19 came and there was not, these, in quotes, big names called prophets did not see it. We must say, God, why? Why? Look at verse 22, we continue praising God. Daniel says, he revealed the deep and secret things. Raise your hands up tonight. Come, let me tell you something. There is nothing God doesn't want to reveal to you or I. He wants to take us, Pastor Stephen, into the deeper things of him. He wants to show us things that previous generations have not seen. If we want to stay on the surface, help yourself. The men of Daniel's stature who says we will spend time with God. Listen to me. Daniel was willing to die for his relationship with God. When he had to face the lion then, and they pass a law, and anyone found praying for one month will be thrown alive into the lion then. Daniel said, here am I. I'm praying as normal. If I perish, I perish. I ain't stop praying. He knew where his strength came from. There are too many Christian leaders are in the hands of political system. They are bought with money. They're given prestige and recognition and they will sell their souls and their ministry for, for silver coins like Judas. For Mercedes Benz, for recognition. They don't care. This Daniel was not compromising. God wants to reveal the deep secrets to the church. We must not look to political systems to guide us. They must look to the church. They must come to us. But they can't come to us because we have nothing. You have how many prophets that prophesy lie on Donald Trump? Lay hands on prophesy, talk in tongues? And then they say the election was stolen. How the devil can steal something that God has decreed will come to pass? You tell me. Explain to me when the Bible you saw that. How the devil can steal what God has orchestrated? How come the devil could not, when he was planning to take, a, put in the heart of Herod the desire to kill, to find the, the he knew that Christ was born. But the idiot did not know where to find, find Jesus. You think God can't protect you, Krista? Sister Agnes, you think God cannot protect you? Man of God, Pastor Stevens, you think God cannot protect you? We have gone so far away from God, it's not funny. The church has become so ordinary. People don't respect our prophets and they have no right to respecting it. Especially American prophets. Huh? Verse 22, read with me, please. He revealed the deep and secret things. He knew it. God knew it. What is in the darkness? Everybody say after me. God knows what is in the darkness. People planning to hurt you and to pull you down. God knows what they're cooking up in the darkness behind you. All the witchcraft workers, all the wickedness, 
all the plots and the mechanism and the schemes. God know what is in the darkness. And the light dwelleth with him. You know why God knows what is in the darkness? Because you live in the light. When you're in the light, you know everything. You never caught nothing. Look in verse 23. Read with me. I thank you. Daniel is really praising God. And I praise you. O oh, thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom. You see where he realized where it came from? It didn't come from my years of experience. It didn't come from the, from the books he read, from the libraries of Babylon. It wasn't this scholastic achievement attained through different scholarships and pursuits of learning. Daniel is saying, oh, thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom, he gave me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desire of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Wow, God, you did it. You alone did it. You see why God could have used Daniel? You see why God could have used Daniel? None of that credit went to Daniel. Some of us, we would, our heads would have gotten so big like we're suffering from spirit, spiritual hydrocephalus. Your head gets so big, your body can't carry. Little experience and all of a sudden, nobody could talk to you. You read it, you're writing books. Every time the wind passed too hard, you get a revelation to write a book. Some men, they can't talk to them. Because I, I, you know who I am? I'm apostle. I, I am bishop. We know nothing. Daniel, give God all the credit. Look in verse 24. Let's read. Therefore, Daniel went in unto, unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him. Hear what Daniel said. Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king. Bring me in. He could have said it with boldness. I'm ready. Take me in. You live with God like that. You'll stand before leaders. You'll stand before. The world will beg for you. Beg for you. Daniel at this stage was a young man. Young. But he knew with God he could become a man amongst men. A leader among leaders. Christian, you young people, Sister Agnes and Joan and Pastor Stephen and Joyce and Susan, you listen to me tonight. Trinidad and Tobago, and those of you listening via a, 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 a later transmission. If we as believers fall on our face before God in true repentance, Ministers of the gospel, hear me. We have to repent. In the body of Christ, especially here in the United States of America, to whom much is given, much is required, we must fall on our faces in mass repentance and cry out to God for his help. Daniel honored God. It wasn't some kind of lip surface, his heart was in what you were saying. God, if you didn't do it, I, it could not have been done. There are things that God wants to do in our life, in this generation. Here in America, God wants to raise up Daniels. He wants to raise up, amen, Joshua's. He wants to raise up Moses, men of this generation that can hear from the heavens, not what you, your own twisted view of thing is. He wants to talk. He wants to bring us into his bank, banqueting hall and talk to us and show us things. People don't respect the church anymore. They have no right respecting us. We have failed the church. We have failed this country. All you can tell people is your phone number, where you're living. We can't bring spiritual awakening anymore. You think it's miracles? It's much more than miracles. It's a life. Out of us, the glory of God must shine. When people come in contact with us, they mustn't say, oh, what a great gifted man. They must see God in your countenance. 
We are being changed from glory to glory where? Into the very image of Christ. God has to help us in this hour. Bring me in, he says, to the king. Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. In verse 24. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste, in haste, because this was a burning matter. The king couldn't sleep. Brought him in, in haste and said unto him. No, I, I want you to note, Pastor Stephen, what? is the king's response. So because he's very skeptical that anybody could have done that. Understand, this king had great skepticism. He knew that those wise men had experience. And Daniel was a young man. Where, where would this young man learn these things from? Hear what the king is, is asking. Ariok said, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. Notice what the king is asking in verse 26. The king answered and said unto Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar? Hear what he's asking. Are thou able, hear this, to make known unto me the dream which I have seen? Not what you have seen. <laughs> you can tell me what I have seen. You better have a deep relationship with God to, to delve into the deep secrets. Could you show me and tell me in truth that what you can tell me is the same dream I had? He is very skeptical. Verse 27. Hear what Daniel said to him. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king had demanded cannot be, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the soothsayers show unto the king. Nobody can do this, Mr. King. What they told you is the truth, they couldn't find out. But there is a God in heaven. A God. If you doubt him, king, there is a God in heaven that reveal it, not demons, a God in heaven that reveal its secrets. You think that God don't want to reveal things to you concerning your children? Concerning the future of your family? Do you think that God don't want to reveal to you his plan for your life? Pastor Stevens, as a man of God, leading God's people, the church doesn't have to beg God, God, show me what you want to do. If we fall before God in true repentance on our faces before him, and ask God, Lord, we want to reach our community. We want to shake Maloney. Lord, what to do? And we'll fall. Be Listen, I believe there has to be genuine, genuine repentance. There are a lot of stuff going on in the body of Christ. And let me tell you something. God is not going to, because you're going to fast. We can fast out of mere tradition, you know. Nothing is going to come from it. Nothing will come from it. If there's not repentance, there are a lot of stuff inside of us that God has to deal with. He told the church of Ephesus, he said the church of Ephesus was a great church. He said, you have left your first love. You have abandoned, you have walked away from intimacy with me. Oh yes, you're hardworking. Oh yes, you committed to the work, but you don't have no intimacy. Your first love, for me, has gone. You have walked away from it. You left it. You abandoned it. You have absconded from that first love. The way you felt about me, you don't feel no more. It's words coming from your mouth. I believe that God is saying to us in this hour, heaven will not respond if there's not genuine repentance. Repentance from the heart. You see deceit? You see dishonesty? You see double dealing? You see lying? Too much lies goes on in the church? Dishonesty? 
You fast, you fast and you pray. You think God's going to hear you because you're praying your fast? Deceit. We see it only in America. We feel because we talk in tongues and we manifest gifts that God is, is forced to respond, he will not. A man with such a heart, God will not hide anything from him. God knows if he were to share certain things with some of us, we will take the credit for it. He knows we, that we do not have the depth, the commitment, devotion to him. So he could trust us to do things in our lives and know that he will be praised for it. He knows that. You think he doesn't want to give to the church certain things, but he can't trust us. Look at the expression. But there is a God in heaven that revealed secrets and make it known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the last days. Underline that, everybody. This dream was not totally for them. The real depth of what was coming would have been for the last days. It will impact. It started the prophetic clock started ticking in their day, but the real manifestation of it is for the last days, our time. <sighs> thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. You notice where God took him? This man lay on his bed one night. This is a king. He lay down on his bed with his head no long behind his head. And he's contemplating because he built an, an amazing kingdom. Babylon was the head of gold, was rich in gold. No other kingdom after Babylon has been wealthy in gold as that kingdom. That's why the head is symbolized as the head of gold. It was wealthy. It was an amazingly beautiful. We're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. Let me just run on. Let me just run on. Right? Thy dream... And the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. Look, everybody, verse 29, they're running. As for thee, as for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What shall come to pass thereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. He lay on his bed thinking what will happen after he's gone. What, what lay in store for my future? What will occur after my time? You think God doesn't want to answer those secrets, my dear? That we have all these concerns about our lives and our family and our history. What will happen to me? You think God doesn't want to be, if, if God was willing to speak to a heathen, King, how much more child of God? How much more child of God? He laid a thinking of the future. And in verse 30, I'll close with this. Let me see how far. I won't go through all of this because this will go up to. I'm going to close here and we are going to pick up when we come back. Look in verse 30 and we close with this. Read everybody. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. And he keep understanding. You see why God used this man? Constantly, he's affirming it had nothing to do with me. If God can trust somebody who could be so selfless, he can take you to places. And hear what he keeps saying. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes, that shall be known, the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. We'll close there. 
And I want you all to read out the rest of chapter two. And I want you to read all of chapter seven because they are correlated. And we have, we have enough time between now until we come back in the first Wednesday in November to start a new year where we're going to deal in the powerful prophetic interpretation. Any question before I close this session tonight? Pastor? Yes. It's the first of January, I mean. The first Wednesday. The first January. Wednesday in January. Yes, yes, yes. Because next you said, week. You said, you said in November. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> November gone, January. <laughs> right? So the first Wednesday in January, in January 2022. I want you all to study these scriptures. I want you to go in. If you get a, your hands on commentaries, read. I don't want you all to come in. If you all follow what Pastor Thompson is saying, you all are going to do well. If you want to be able to help other people, this is where you have to learn. So you can take the information you have and share it with the other people. We are going somewhere with this. This is a You see these revelations here are connected to our time. And I want you to understand that. Anybody else as we? Anyone else as we come in for a landing? No one else. All right. Now, so do your reading. Um, Sister Chris, did you get you with any uh, any more of those? You saw the, the one with the image. Let me see what it looks yes. like. All right, no problem. So let me share the screen. Beautiful. It will be a lot of excitement because we have a lot of graphics to show you all. All right, so I got this. Ah, one. there we go. Beautiful. Yeah, so I got this one. Krista, you got it good. Then there was this one. Yes, yes. And then, Look at this one here. Go back to the other one. Look at that. You all are going to understand the meaning of those things you're watching on the screen. Now, give it, you're getting a preview where we're heading, right? It will be a lot of action, a lot of graphics. We'll be explaining to you what all those things mean. Chris, you did extremely well. I'm very proud of you. No problem. Very great work. So, everybody, get yourself together, get into the studies, right? I don't care if one of you sure. I'm going to be committed to teach anyone who is faithful to come in here and be willing to listen and to study God's word. All right? So let's, thanks again. You can come out of there. And we are going to close this session tonight. Uh, we have about eight persons on tonight. We thank God for those. I know what Trinidad is like. So I want you all to know, the people that God is going to reveal himself to are those who are committed to him. See, a lot of us want the best from God, but we are not willing to give God the best we have. That's our problem. You want God, God, you yeah, Lord, I break through. What break through you want again? You don't have time to spend in the word of God. How many people will never show up to Bible study? But you want God's best? You're not committed to the things of God? No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Let's go on hearts in prayer tonight. Father, I want to thank you for Sister Krista, Joyce, Sister Agnes, Sister Joanne and Susan, and Pastor Stevens. We thank you for these who have made a commitment, Lord, to come out and to listen to your word. As we look at the great truth, Father, you give to your servant, Daniel, which connects to our time. I ask that you'll place within us a hunger, a burning hunger for your need. Use us as more than ever before in these very dark days in which you are alive. Touch every heart I ask in Jesus' name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit continue to rest, remain, and abide upon us all, both for now and forevermore. 
And God's people say, Amen. God bless you richly until we meet first Wednesday, January 2022. God bless you guys. God bless.